what do I want to do? I want to record. Hmm. There we go. Cool. And yes, that's my reminder. Okay. I actually, I've been thinking about, um, so I sent uh, by emails your essay topics for essay number two. I said your essay number one would be back soon. Soon was not as soon as I hoped, but it will be back by Thursday. So getting there. So essay number two is coming up because we're getting to the end of the second unit already. I can't believe it. Um, and so in the last class, I started thinking about some kind of, you know, going back over things and, and sort of recapping and overviewing. And I wanted to do a little bit of that again today. I gave you this at the very beginning of the unit, uh, a quote from Michelle Rolf Trio, one of my favorite mentor anthropologists, the ultimate mark of power may be its invisibility, the ultimate challenge, the exposition of its roots. And we talked about how, you know, this section officially in guess was called unmasking the, unmasking the structures of power. But we're not gonna do any unmasking because we're all gonna be masked up. So we talked about exposing the roots of power, which is a similar thing. But I wanna talk about something that is, um, is related to that, which is how, well, how does power become invisible in the first place? How does it happen that, you know, I mean, if we're supposed to be exposing the roots of power or unmasking the structures of power, why do we have to do that? And I, I've been talking, we've been talking about how, you know, when you have something that is invisible and it's, and that's how you know something is very powerful, um, but how does, how does it become invisible? What is the mechanisms by which something that is a relationship of power becomes invisible? And so this is what we've been talking about through this unit, right? We've, we did race and racism, ethnicity and nationalism, gender and sexuality. We're on sexuality next week, kinship and marriage. And if you think about all of these things, things, I think what sort of unites them, and in the last class I could have sort of, uh, I talked about how well, you know, if you pair up race and racism, it seems automatically bad, and so maybe then we can sort of pair up ethnicity and ethnocentrism or gender and sexism to kind of give it that pairing, but there's a different way, I think, it dawned on me that there's a different way to think about these things, which is that all of them are ways in which people uh, live life. We live our life with these kinds of things and we sort of take them for granted as if, you know, we just assume that that's the way things are. Whether that be uh, that people come in various races or even racism, I think that, you know, I, I mean, fortunately today, I believe that people are calling into question some of the structures of racism, but there, there were, there were in our times in our history when people basically thought it was their job to kind of enforce racism. It was just taken for granted that that was something that, they, that people did. Um, so all of these things are things that people take as natural, their ethnicity, their, that everyone should have a nation, gender, often completely unassumed, sexuality, uh, and then as we'll talk about who we're related to, who you should marry, why, when, these are all things that have been assumed or have been uh, taken without any kind of question. And so that's how, you know, that's, that's, that's how you know it's, it's a powerful relationship when these things that are not, well, okay. So how do these things, what is the mechanism by which they become invisible? And I think one of the biggest ways at least in our society today, has been the claim that some, any one of these things is natural, that it's the natural way to be, whether that be a natural way of being sexual or a natural way of, 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 being, um, of being an ethnicity, that it's somehow given in nature. Now, another way that some people do this is by saying something is, is biological or genetic. So, you know, oh, race, well, that's, that's physical difference. It's all biology. There's nothing, there's nothing cultural about that. Or, you know, or, or sexuality is, is completely given to us by our genetics. We're 
about to discover the gay gene or whatever that is. Um, so, you know, I think that that oftentimes the natural is supported by or it's made to be invisible because there's the claim that it goes back to being biological or genetic. Again, there's another way of saying these things are, are not called into question. They become taken for granted or just assumed to be, they're just some, you know, you're just living your life. And, and a lot of, you know, I mean, a lot of life, if you're always walking around questioning everything, life becomes very difficult, right? I mean, you can't do this all the time. That's why we go to college to sort of think about things and have this separate space where we think about things for a while without having to necessarily, uh, you know, a lot of times we do have to just go in there and take things for granted, but this is the way that they become taken for granted. Another way in which uh, things are, are said to be invisible or I mean are, are assumed to be that's the way they should be has been the idea that they are sanctioned by some sort of divine power some sort of religious sanction my feeling is in today's United States that saying something is sanctioned by God is going to work with a certain part of the population but probably a lot of people are not gonna go for that. It's just, it's something that may have worked back in the day, um, but it's probably not going to work uh, for many people today. I mean, it, it's still out there and I, I, I don't know, sometimes I think, you know, because, because we all have our own bubbles of reality, um, it's hard for me to say sometimes how much this is still out there and believed. Certainly when I was taking my drive, and looking at signs, I saw one sign for a presidential candidate which said, God's, or no, God, comma, guns. And then I drove past, I couldn't read the next part. But it was like, what, God, guns, guns, God. I mean, just that association was, I, I did want to know what the next word was going to be. God, guns, and what? What was the next word going to be? I have no idea. But, you know, I mean, that would be a sort of, um, you know, the, the idea that somehow God and guns go together. Now, I think for most of us, at least in this class, I think, you know, I mean, we, it would seems a little bit strange to put God and guns together, but it may not be strange out there somewhere. So I don't want to say this is completely gone from our lives. It's certainly still around the idea that certain relationships are divinely sanctioned. Now, the social scientific way to, that we sometimes talk about this invisibility or how uh, certain relationships are taken for granted or accepted, consented. We've talked about this, the idea of hegemony. So power relationships that are hegemonic are those that are really not going to be challenged or disputed because everybody assumes that's the way that things are supposed to be. Um, something like, uh, you know, the American dream is, for the most part, I think a hegemonic idea, right, that anyone can succeed in America. And so, you know, a lot of people support the system as it is, support a capitalist system, because they, they truly believe that anybody's going to be able to be at the top. So, you know, you don't want to have, you don't want to have high taxes on the rich because you think you might be rich someday. And so it's, you know, that would be perhaps an example of hegemony. Oh, wait, we have a chat. God, guns, and Trump. Hmm. God, that's what it was, huh? Like I said, I was driving too fast. All I saw is the God, guns part, and it was on a Trump sign. But what if it have said God, guns, and Trump, and Trump, there again? I don't know. Yeah, maybe. Okay. Well, there you go. Divinely sanctioned. God's told us who to vote for right there. Okay. Hegemonic. Right. I would say that that is not a hegemonic idea, by the way. I don't think, I don't think people are, are necessarily accepting of that one. In fact, I think that these days, if you are invoking God for something, it's probably because you don't have hegemony. It's probably because you're 
you're really trying. Um, so, okay, so the hegemonic is one of the social science ways we talk about things. And the other way which I introduced to us from Bourdieu is the idea of doxa, or that which goes undiscussed or undisputed. So, you know, I mean, the, th the, the thing is, is right now guns and God are, are quite discussed and disputed. Um, they are not doxa by any means, they're part of our debate. So what we're thinking about here are things that, that go undiscussed or undisputed, things that you don't even call into question. And so this is one of the things that on your paper topics, uh, I just sent them to you, but one of the things that you can do is talk about assumptions. So, you know, you take one of these themes, race or gender, and something maybe in the guest textbook that has been surprising, maybe you're not surprised by anything, but maybe it would be surprising for somebody that you know. And then, you know, just explore, you know, well, what do people assume about that? What, or what did you once assume about that? How, how is this taken for granted? And how can you use one of, you know, use one of those think like an anthropologist ideas to show how this thing that everybody assumes is one way or you assumed was one way is actually uh, maybe different cross-culturally, uh, maybe I just said socially transmitted. So that's, you know, another word for saying we learn it in a society. Uh, we might also talk about it as socially constructed and uh, variable over history is, is made by our historical actions and, and maybe has changed over time. So that would be one thing that you could do is just hone in on a particular something and run with it a little bit in terms of what do people assume about it? What can we do differently as anthropologists? Question so far. Okay. All right, so now I want to talk about this nifty little diagram that Pierre Bourdieu came up with. I think he might have, one of the professors I had said he stole it from a mathematician back in the day, but I, I think this, I think we'll give Bourdieu, the French sociologist, sometimes called an anthropologist, uh, we'll give him credit for this. Um, it's a, it's a nifty way it's a, a nifty way to, to think about the world, especially at times when things are being debated a lot. And so Bourdieu gives us this idea of things that are in the universe of the undiscussed, the undisputed, which he called doxa. So those are the things that, you know, everybody just assumes or or you don't discuss them because they don't even come up to consciousness. And in some ways it is the doxa that makes possible, and that's why it kind of surrounds, surrounds the circle. It makes possible this other universe of opinion or discourse, which are the things that people talk about and debate. And so if you're having an opinion, if you're having a debate, there's the orthodox position, which is kind of the, what we might call the traditional position, or maybe the majority position. And then there's the heterodox position, which is the position that challenges whatever it is that is in opinion. But notice that oftentimes the, the heterodoxy doesn't necessarily challenge the doxa, it's, it's challenging one part of it, but it doesn't necessarily result in some sort of enormous social change, depending upon uh, how much is being undiscussed or undisputed. So let me give you an example of this, which I think relates to, to our, our reading for today on sexuality. So let's think about uh, same-sex marriage ideas about same-sex marriage and how that's changed over time. So let's rewind ourselves and try to think about what life must have been like about 70 years ago in the 1950s, let's say. If you said gay marriage or same-sex marriage, 
it would have been, it wouldn't have even entered into the universe of opinion. It would have been seen as completely unthinkable, like it wasn't even a thing. Now, in the United States, now don't get me wrong, that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that nothing was happening uh, in terms of sexuality, either here or in other parts of the world, but simply the idea that two people of the same sex would get married would, would be sort of unthinkable. It wouldn't even be part of the, the universe of, you wouldn't even dispute that because there was nothing to dispute. There'd be nothing to, uh, you know, and I, I think that there was, there was a certain point in time in which, you know, with the emergence of, of an identification as homosexual or where they were sort of rebelling against all those ideas anyway, they would say, well, we don't want marriage. That's, that's too doxa. So that wouldn't even be part of the, the, doc, the, the opinion. Now, as we know, then there was a debate. So eventually, and in part because, because of healthcare actually, uh, and, and sort of discrimination against uh, people who were, uh, you know, who, who needed health care, uh, the issue of, of same-sex marriage or gay marriage comes into the universe of opinion. And when it first comes in, it comes in as a heterodox opinion, right? It's challenging the orthodoxy. And, you know, all sorts of politicians, even those politicians who we might consider today to be liberals, were, you know, I mean, it was, it was not something that was being embraced by, certainly wasn't embraced by Republicans and it was not being embraced by Democrats either. So the orthodoxy was not in favor and you didn't, you didn't win any elections running on uh, same-sex marriage. So that was a heterodox opinion for a long time. At a certain point, I'm not sure exactly when this happened, it, it seems like all of a sudden it, not all of a sudden, over time, it actually became more orthodox than heterodox. And you didn't want to align yourself, at least if you were in certain parts, you, 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 it became more of kind of a, a more accepted opinion. And, and actually uh, people who were trying to make uh, same-sex marriage illegal or fighting against it in some ways ended up more in the heterodox opinion of a side of things. And I don't, you know, I mean, I think a number of you wrote about in the comments and, and certainly uh, these issues are, are perhaps coming up in this election again, but it would be my contention that especially among the youth, that for many of you, same-sex marriage is more like doxa now. I mean, it's not even up for debate. It's something that is seen as, you know, well, that's the way things should be, we don't even have to discuss or dispute it because that's just, you know, that's just the way things are. I mean, I think that, um, you know, I think that that's, like I said, I think that we're, we're now in a, in, a, uh, in a time when those issues are perhaps coming back up, but for a bit, for a bit, and maybe it'll come back, uh, it sort of entered into the doxa again. So, like I said, this is kind of a useful, thing to think about when you think about, okay, what's being debated and what's being assumed and what, what makes possible the debate that we're having. And so my contention would be that if you, you don't, that my contention would be that you don't need to come to college to have opinion and debate. You can do that sort of on your own. Um, what we get in college, which I think is hopefully more interesting in that, is we get these, this idea of the undiscussed or undisputed and trying to, to sort of outline what underlies the debate. So that was my second idea for a paper topic, which is that, you know, this is a wonderful time to pick a candidate or a race or some Senate hearing or some issue that's going on and just talk about, okay, well, what what is the what is the orthodox opinion? What is the heterodox? What's the what's the debate? And what are the assumptions that underlie that debate? And how is this changing over time? Of course, you know, related to one of the things that we've been thinking about: race, racism, ethnicity, nation, gender, sexuality. So you know, I mean, you don't have to use exactly Bourdieu, but it would be 
uh, it might be useful to think about, you know, when you're analyzing the electoral politics of today, a number of you made reference to various things that are going on in sexuality and politics in your posts. And, you know, if you want to sort of take that further, this might be a good time to have fun with that. Questions? All right. Well, we're getting a little bit into our theme for today, which is sexuality. Talked about same-sex marriage and debates and stuff like that. So a couple of things I wanted to uh, draw to your attention from the guest chapter. His uh, definition of sexuality, the complex range of desires beliefs and behaviors that are related to erotic physical contact, intimacy, and pleasure. Um, you know, I just wanted to point this out. I, I was always, when I, when I was studying these things for the first time, I was always confused about what the difference was between gender and sexuality. And I think Guest does a nice job here uh, defining what's going on. Um, I've underlined erotic physical contact because that in itself is in some ways culturally variable. What counts as erotic, what is seen as erotic is going to be, uh, is, is going to be part, of, uh, part of the cultural debate. And so he then adds on a second part to this, which is that this is the cultural arena within which people debate ideas of what kinds of physical desires and behaviors are morally right, appropriate, and natural. So there's that word again. Uh, yeah, the moral, um, you know, the, the sanctioned by some sort of higher power or maybe just by biology. What is morally right, appropriate, and natural? So whenever we're talking about sexuality, uh, even, even its very definition and what counts as sexual is going to be up for debate. And then at the end of it, he adds on a, a third part to that sentence, which is, is also often going to be about status in society, about power, uh, privileges, and, and access to resources. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty wide ranging definition. Um, and you know, I think Guest does, does well with this. Like I said, I was always confused about would talk about gender and sex and sexuality. So I think we hopefully we have have that pretty outlined. Then he brings in two of my least favorite people in the world. One of them being the ornithologist, biologist, Jared Diamond, who I make some of you read Jared Diamond in intro classes. Uh, he wrote an article called The Worst Mistake in the History of the Human Race about agriculture. He often acts like he's an anthropologist or an archeologist and has, uh, he, I'm, I'm not a big Jared Diamond fan and I can't believe that Guest uses him here. And I thought in his third edition that Guest would be smart enough to exclude Jared Diamond from this, but there he is again, going back to 1997, the animal with the weirdest sex life, which of course is human beings. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't know, I don't wanna go on and on about this, but I'll just say that I think that Diamond's points here that Guest borrows are kind of themselves weird. So Diamond is trying to say that humans are outliers among the mammalian kingdom in terms of our sex life. And I guess that might be true. I guess we might be outliers, but I would also say, um, how to say? Well, bonobos and human beings, if we compare ourselves to the bonobos, which are equally related to us as chimpanzees, the bonobos seem to have as, you know, maybe even a more varied sexual rep repertoire than human beings, seem to have sex for fun all the time. 
seem to do a lot of face-to-face -face copulation. So, you know, I don't even know if we're out, I mean, I guess the bonobos are outliers among the, the, uh, the great apes as well, but you know, I don't know. Some of this seems a little bit, I don't, I'm not convinced we're as weird uh, in, the, in the animal kingdom as Diamond does. And I guess I just also wanna draw attention to this thing that Diamond says that most mammals engage in public sex, whereas humans as a rule have a sex in private, which you know, um, the whole definition of what is public and private is going to be historical and cross-cultural and uh, you know, I'm not gonna get into people and sex and public stuff and private stuff, but I just think that it doesn't, it doesn't all make sense to me. And then he takes on another one of my least favorite people not that I disliked him personally, but you know, uh, physical anthropologist, she called, he called her physical anthropologist. I think she's might be a biological anthropologist, Helen Fisher. And I'm not actually sure what his point is here and bring, I think she has been very much, uh, you know, at the forefront of sort of uh, trying to explain human sexuality in terms of chemical reactions and stuff like that. And again, I'm just, this seems, doesn't seem like it helps us that much for me. And the reason I'll show you something that, that will, I think maybe to, to, like I said, to, I'm not sure if this is gonna prove my point. Remember when I had you type in anthropology.com into your web browsers and up pop that store? Well, try this, type in chemistry dot com, www.chemistry.com into your web browser. And this is what comes up. You know, it was bad enough when the anthropology discipline got taken over by a store, but poor chemists, the whole chemistry division of science has been taken over by a dating site, chemistry.com. You can meet other singles near I guess I typed it into Oneonta. Here they are. And Dr. Helen Fisher is like part of this weird thing where she's going to give you a personality test and match you up with somebody. So, you know, the very end of this, thank God most of you answered that anthropology cannot tell you who to date, but uh, maybe we can. I don't know, go to chemistry.com and find out. Actually, don't do that. Just don't go there. Just, well, I can't tell you what to do, but don't, don't do it on my account. If you want to go there, that's fine. Anyway, I much prefer another biologist who is not an anthropologist, Joan Roughgarden, who wrote a book called Evolution's Rainbow. And to me, this was a really fascinating book because what she did is instead of trying to claim that human beings were the outliers, that we were the weirdos, she said, well, the problem has been that biologists only look at what they assume to be important evolutionarily, which is reproductive sex, because if it, you don't, you know, if you have sex that's not reproductive, according to the biologists, it doesn't matter because it hasn't influenced the course of evolution. And she said, the problem is that we weren't looking at all the things that other creatures were doing across nature. And if we, you know, if we looked a little more, if we opened our eyes a little bit, we'd find out that there were all kinds of homosexual same-sex behavior from reindeer to African elephants to marmots, vampire bats. And they do all this other stuff, which we won't get into. So the point of the matter is, I don't know if we're outliers. There's all kinds of things that all kinds of creatures do in the world. And oftentimes we just haven't been looking for it because we're so focused on reproductive activities because of our, our desire to explain evolution. So I would be happier if, if we had that in there. Okay, so. Um, I think one of the biggest points, if, if I had to say there's, there's something that is kind of really revelatory or, or revolutionary about what 
people studying sexuality uh, within an anthropology and, and beyond have kind of uh, revealed is that we that our activities, the things that we do might be associated with an identity, but they might not be associated with a certain identity. And they may be associated differently in different societies with an identity. So, I mean, it's kind of like the distinction we made between sex and gender, where we talked about sex as sort of the biological or the physical differences that we can think about and observe. And then we talked about the cultural expectations and roles. And it's the same here. I mean, people and other creatures have been having all sorts of, have done all sorts of sex things, but that doesn't always mean that they've identified as, you know, that they've made that into an experience, an identity, a role, or identified with that kind of thing. And, um, hmm, I didn't, you know, this took me into some strange internet searching, so I didn't, I don't know if I wanted to, to mention this, but it made me think, you know, when we think about sexual activities, what is probably the most prevalent human sexual activity in the United States today? Like what most people are doing. May want to jar up that in the chat. It's too embarrassing to say out loud. <laughs> Probably too embarrassing to put in the chat. If you go think about it by yourselves for a long time, you'll probably come up with it. Okay, so, and I wonder, you know, if you're doing that, does it matter what you're thinking about? Are there heterosexual acts of delete that. Anyway, um, here we go. So guess looks at sexuality around the world. And so it's really important for us to understand, right, that you can observe uh, certain activities, but that doesn't necessarily mean it, it becomes an identification or an identity. And so uh, a couple examples uh, the guest doesn't talk about, but I just want to mention, for example, um, as we all know, there was probably a, a decent amount of same-sex activity among uh, ancient Greeks. That doesn't mean that they identified necessarily as homosexual or heterosexual. And there's a very famous uh, anthropological example of uh, a, the, it's sort of in, in Papua New Guinea of a group in which uh, people believe or the, the men believe that they need to uh, sort of, how to say, they need, they need to ingest semen in homosexual acts in order to have the power to do heterosexual acts with women. And so it sounds a little weird, I guess, maybe a lot weird, but where would you draw the line then there with, you know, sex and identity? I'll mention one other, which is in the text, which is, you know, the, uh, uh, the study by Roger Lancaster, but happens in many places in, in, uh, in Latin America, which is that in some ways, um, men who would have sex with other men would, would consider themselves not to be homosexual at all, would consider themselves to be completely heterosexual as long as they were on the doing the penetrating. And it's only the people who were penetrated who would be, who would be typed as being homosexual. Now, none of these characterizations or none of these things is, uh, is necessarily good or better than the way we 
classify things, but it does hopefully help us think about that, you know, just because someone is, just because we can see certain activities does not mean they're necessarily equal to an identity. And so I like here, I also, one of the things I like, because in fact, the invention of a homosexual identity is often discussed. It's sort of, it's been discussed a lot how in some ways, yes, there were homosexual activities going on throughout the world, throughout history, but the idea that you would identify as gay or as lesbian um, is kind of a, a more recent historical phenomenon. And so, you know, I like the guest here also talks about, well, the whole, whole idea that you would, obviously heterosexual activities have been going on for a long, long time all, all over the place as well. But the idea that you would identify as straight or identify as heterosexual is also a relatively recent invention and is supported by a number of cultural practices. One of you mentioned the white weddings, which is super fascinating there too. How are we doing? Good. Great class. I want to talk a little bit about this end part. Where guests tell us in thinking like an anthropologist that although anthropology may not be able to help you decide whom to date, so I'm most concerned about that whom part. It's not right. Whom to date? What do you say? It's hard for me to understand when to use whom and when to use who. This sounds bad to me, doesn't it? It doesn't sound right. It might be technically correct. I wondered if somebody came up to you because one one of the way one of the tests you can do right is to turn it into a question if someone came up to you and said hey whom are you dating what would you do i'd make me would make me want to hit them i'd be mad i'd be like what whom who are you dating what are you talking about the reason i'm asking you these things <laughs> i'm playing with this a little bit is I'm thinking about the idea of hypercorrection and the use of whom. If you know you're supposed to use whom, there are some certain times that, that, that you use whom. And if you really know what you're doing, you should use it. But watch out because you don't want to use it incorrectly, which is very, which can be common. Um, and then it becomes something we refer to as hypercorrection. Um, which is that people want to sound smarter or they think when they're writing something in a paper that you need to use a lot of whom's or, you know, instead of saying, well, you can send it to me. Have you ever heard somebody say this? You can send it to myself. You know, it's like, no, just say, send it to me. Or, you know, people know that you're supposed to say like, you know, Martha and I are going on a walk, but then if you hyper correct that and you're always saying, and I, so uh, let's see. Uh, would you like to go to the beach with Martha and me is technically correct, but people will often correct to Martha and I, right? So hyper correction is something that, that happens when people are trying to sort of um, think they need to be more, hmm more formal, more smart. I bring that up because of this word, intersectionality. This is my third paper topic idea. Um, intersectionality is, uh, is a really interesting form of analysis. We've seen it in various parts of this place, how you want to uh, consider, for example, race and social class together or race, social class and gender together. And so, you know, I mean, I think that it would be neat to, uh, to do a, a, a paper where you thought about something that you didn't think about connecting before and using intersectional analysis. But, you know, I wonder out there in the world, it's kind of like the idea of culture. How is the word intersectional and intersectionality working out there in the world when you hear that? 
if you tell that to people uh, at some, we don't do social gatherings. If you talk about that with somebody who's never heard it before and you say, yes, so we're gonna do some intersectional analysis, what do they think is going on? I bring that up, I actually, uh, I actually had a, uh, uh, it's, this came to me from my conversation I had with my daughter where she was doing one of these workshops and she was like, I think when people say intersectionality, what they really just mean is diversity, but they think it sounds cooler to say intersectionality, right? So this is my, you know, I think that, uh, I, I'm not sure, like I said, I'm not sure how intersectionality is doing out there in the world, but sometimes I think people use it and they they just mean they want other people to be included. They're not actually doing intersectional analysis. I had another couple examples of that, which is, you know, sometimes people will say, well, you're, you're, uh, you know, you're using your white privilege or your, you know, your, that statement is all about white privilege. And sometimes I think that's true and it's a good thing to know about. And we've talked about white privilege, but sometimes somebody's just being racist. And so, you know, I mean, it's a, maybe a more polite thing to say they're exercising their right white privilege, but you might just, might just have to call out racism from time to time. And then I don't know if you've heard this phrase uh, that, you know, if you're gaslighting someone or gaslighting or you've been gaslit. It's, a very, it's actually a very specific and interesting and, and sort of, uh, uh, it, it's a, a kind of a technical term. I won't go through the whole history of, you know, manipulating someone else's reality so that they think they're crazy. And uh, this often, um, it happens way too often uh, actually, uh, and we're, I, I, fortunately, I think as a society, we are understanding how that works, but I think sometimes people just use it. And really people are, some people are just lying. They're just straight up lying and we call it gaslighting and it makes it sound like they're being smarter than they are. Sometimes you just have to call out lying. So there's all a way of saying when you are writing, and like I said, I'll get your first essays to you uh, by tomorrow, but uh, there were some things that I noticed in there uh, that may be related to this tendency for us to be hypercorrect or hypercorrection. So here's some uh, some things that I hope I hope will help you in your life, at least in your life when you write an essay for me. Um, a lot of us have been uh, how to say in school we get we we get taught that you can't ever say I in a paper, you should never use the first person. And so when we do it, when we avoid the first person, it, we end up with some weird sentences, you know, like the field work observations were conducted. It's like, no, I did some field work. I mean, maybe not that informal, but I observed, right? So. If you are in, you know, if, if you were there and you were doing the stuff, it is okay to say, you know, I did this, especially if it's going to result in, a, in an active verb instead of a passive verb, uh, go ahead, go for the I. Now, I think that, uh, ah, there I go. Uh, what you can fall into a trap is, is that if you, if a lot of your sentences, a lot of your passages begin with I think or I believe or it is my opinion that um, that you don't need to do um, because your name is on the paper. And so I'm going to hope that whatever you write is what you think and believe, right? So you usually, most of the time, if you've written I believe, you can look at that sentence and say, uh, you can just strike out the I believe part and it will be perfectly fine. It'll be a perfectly great sentence without the I think or I believe. That, but I don't, you know, I used to, I used to get really, uh, I used to get really pesky about this. I'm not anymore because sometimes uh, an occasional I think or I believe can be very effective. Just, 
be careful with that one, but don't be afraid to use I. I know, I know that goes against what some people uh, tell you to do, but go for it. This is another thing, uh, you know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not sad when I see a title page, I guess a whole page devoted to a title, you know, with a big header on it is, you know, and I guess it makes me happy that someone has taken the trouble. But usually if you're, if you're going to be writing something that's under five, 10 pages, you probably don't need a whole separate page for your title. Now, especially if somebody's going to be printing out that out. That's just, that's just not good for the environment. So, you know, this is not a big deal, but usually you, you can get away with a, you know, a, a header or a first, you know, a first page header and then a running page number in there. Um, usually you don't need a, a big old title page. This was kind of puzzling to me because we've been taught or, the, you know, the popular stereotype is that students can't write long paragraphs and their paragraphs are getting so short and short and short because we all use Twitter so much. Um, and on many of your papers, I thought your paragraphs were actually on the long side. So, you know, you can always just eyeball it and look and see if it looks like a paragraph that is getting way out of hand. Um, but you can also just double click on it and it'll tell you how many words they are. Most paragraphs should be in the 100 to 200 word uh, range. If you're going beyond that, you probably need to split it up. You're probably developing a couple different thoughts in there. So I'm not sure exactly why this happens. It, it usually happened like right after your thesis paragraph or a couple paragraphs in. I think it might also happen if you're worried about having enough to write that you just start writing and it just keeps going and then you've got a big long paragraph and you're like, yay, great. But you know, go back through there and you put in, put a, put a paragraph break in there. So, you know, but the reason I say it might be related to hypercorrection is sometimes we're taught that longer, longer is better in terms of writing and just keep it, keep it succinct. Not, if you go below a hundred words, then it's gonna look like a tiny little short thing. So you have, don't wanna do the opposite, but be, um, so I guess, you know, I mean, I think there's a little bit of difference between a uh, hyper correction, which is overdoing it and just being formal. I mean, writing isn't speaking, writing is its own style. Uh, you know, it might be good to uh, cut your apostrophes and abbreviations just to be formal about it. And you don't want to be breezy. So you can be both formal and direct at the same time. And sometimes being more formal makes your writing more direct. And so, you know, it's just, it's something to balance out with the hypercorrection. Now, so the other thing I'll say is that a lot of times when you're reading a paper, you'll get about halfway through or even at the end and you'll find out that there is something that, the, that you wanted to say, but it doesn't come out until halfway through or at the very end. And I would say that you really want to, uh, when you're writing your paper, you really want to put the best thing you have, your biggest point that you're going to support and argue on, uh, you want that to be at the very beginning. And, uh, you know, so you don't want to bury that. And I think about, you know, when you're scrolling through like, I don't know if you use Facebook anymore, but you're scrolling through Facebook and somebody's written something that's like that long and you have to click more. Like, when was the last time you ever clicked more to see what they've written? And it's kind of the same thing with a paper. Whatever you got, you got to give it to them give it to them at the beginning. So they want to click more. If it's good at the beginning, then they're gonna to wanna to read more of it. So usually what we call this 
is, you know, it's, it's an old fashioned uh, trick, but it still works a decent amount of the time, which is to think about your last sentence of your first paragraph. So you're, you know, your first few sentences are going to be, you know, introductory and, you know, kind of describing what you're doing. But then at, at, you're always right at the end of that first paragraph, the last sentence of your first paragraph, maybe the first sentence of your second paragraph, that's going to be where you want to kind of put in the roadmap or what you're going to be arguing or what you're thinking about for the rest of the paper. And then you bring in your, your 100 to 200 word evidence paragraph to support that as you're going along, as you're going through the paper. Now, I will say that a lot of times what happens to us is we write, this happens to me all the time, writing is a form of thinking. And so we write and we write and we write, and then we get to the end and it finally comes out what we were thinking, or we finally figure out what it was we were thinking about and writing about. And so it's often the case that what we need to do is move that thought to the very beginning and then kind of rework things. So we, we figured out the thought that we're supporting there. So uh, those are some general suggestions. Like I said, I'll have your, uh, your first essays back to you uh, by Thursday or by tomorrow. And then you have your second essay topics to sort of think about. Um, and uh, that's all I had to say. Questions? Hello out there. Much nicer day today than yesterday. You can go for a car ride today, tomorrow. Try to do it. Be happy. <laughs> All right. Thank you. We'll see you Monday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.